started. Um, yeah, so everybody welcome. Thank you so much for coming. We're so excited to have everybody. And thank you to our two executives, Jessica Word and Dean Stoker. Uh, my name is Mark Wax. I'm the moderator of the event. And I'm also the VP of operations at Leadership Scholars. Uh, I would first like to introduce you to the director of the Center for Leadership here on campus, uh, which is Dr. Jay Barbuto. Dr. Jay Barbuto works to bring unparalleled enrichment experiences to all of the engaged students who are here today. So uh, Dr. Jay, if you'd like to say something. Yeah, great. Thank you, Mark. And welcome everyone. I'm so glad that you students could come and join us here on this Friday afternoon. There's so many things in this world we could all be doing, but it's so great that you've decided to invest in yourself and invest in your own uh, development uh, and take advantage of this incredible access that you're, that you're getting to two people that I have come to know quite a bit over the, over the last several years. These are two amazing individuals. I'm gonna build them up here, but these are two amazing individuals, two of my favorite people that I have had the privilege of meeting in Orange County since I, since I came out here. For those of you attending Leadership Scholars for the first time today, this is a big day because you'll get to see firsthand the caliber and the quality of the experiences that we bring you on a regular basis. We at the center, we do three things and we do three things really, really well. We connect, we develop, and we serve. And today's event is a great example of all three. So <laughs> thank you so much. We have a great staff. We have a great team at the center. Rozzy Burkett is here and in the house. She directs and leads the center's Leadership Scholars Program. She is our event and program specialist. Whenever we have an event like our awards lunch or any event at the center, she is at the center of it, making sure that it goes off without a hitch. We also have with us our business and community specialist, Danya Bari. Danya, wave. Danya does everything involving the center's interface with the business community, whether it's our services that we provide to businesses, our um, television show, our um, newsletters, all of those kinds of uh, interfaces. A lot of, she does a lot of work with our board members and, and things, and she oversees our alumni as well. So we have an amazing team at the center and we have amazing support in the community. This is the kind of experience that can change your life. Like so many before you, their lives have been changed by being a part of this program. So with that, Mark, I'd like to turn things back over to our host with the most, Mark Wax. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. J. Um, as always, we encourage all of you to get involved. Once you become a leadership scholar, you are invited to join um, in our five different boards. And so I'm just gonna go through the five different boards quickly and give you a, a rundown of what each entails. So development is about developing and planning the interactive workshops that we offer to the students. Human resources is engaged with all areas of membership from inviting eligible scholars to join to awarding scholarships based on member participation. Marketing is essential to encourage new membership and to get the word out about all of the amazing and free opportunities the Center for Leadership provides for the campus community. Operations is responsible for the Meet the Executive series events and our members engage directly with the executives and host the event. And community outreach partners with the community to create meaningful volunteer opportunities for our members to volunteer and give back. Now I would like to pass it off to Jehu Jogwe to introduce our first executive. Thank you, Mark. Hello, everyone. My name is Jehu Jogwe, and it is my pleasure to introduce to you all one of today's special guests, Jessica Word. Jessica is a Cal State Fullerton alumni and is passionate about driving innovation as the president of Word and Brown General Agency. Insurance runs in Jessica's blood and she's close and she worked close and she works closely with the Center for Leadership. And this year she was actually awarded the honor as the honoree for excellence in executive leadership and innovation by the Center for Leadership. Everyone, please give a warm virtual welcome to Jessica Ward. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jehu. 
so I'm going to start by asking Jessica, would you be preferred or would you prefer to be addressed as Jessica or Miss Word? Jessica. Jessica, okay. So I'm going to begin by asking you three introductory questions. So the first one is at the start of your career, did you ever envision yourself running a company? Before, thank you for that question. Before I get there, I did want to say thank you. And it's a blessing to be here today. It's an honor to be here. And I'm really excited, obviously, because I'm Cal State, you know, fellow Titan alumni. Um, but it's a blessing to be here today and have any good impact, positive or negative. It's all impact, right, uh, for the students. And so thank you for everybody's uh, support in this. OK, so the question is, at the start of my career, did I ever envision myself uh, running a company? Absolutely not. <laughs> Um, for me, I, I've always, whatever I've done, I've always just strived to, to be the best I could uh, be and do the best I can do, uh, whatever, whatever I'm uh, certainly tasked with. You know, I learned, I learned pretty early that what you envision for yourself, for your future can change daily, sometimes a few times that day, you know, because for me, a sense of control is an illusion. Um, it's only how we react in daily interactions and situations that truly impact and what's going to happen to us for the future. And so uh, when I first began, no, not at all. Uh, I never envisioned that for myself, um, partly because I had self-limiting beliefs back then and I encourage everyone to, to let go of that, but absolutely not. I never did. Awesome. Thank you so much. Our next question is what characteristics have you developed to become the leader you are today? <clears throat> There's a lot of characteristics over time and they've just matured over time. But uh, I would say I've really learned how you show up affects everything. It's your frequency, it creates your reality. And that, that's most important. And creating culture uh, that helped become, help my company become the company that it used to be and it still is today. And it's helped me continue to be the great leader I am today is creating culture and creating an environment in, in which we could all learn to work together. And, you know, being that means uh, creating an environment in which everyone is fully seen and fully safe and fully heard. And so honing in on that and focusing on that, how important it is to, to operate from a sense of community. The Latin term of community is come, that means to come with unity. And so it's really important uh, to continue to have that type of environment uh, in, in a company, at least within my company. And my characteristics that I always lead with uh, is essentially grace, clarity, and compassion. And to do this, one must have honed in the skill of listening. And in order to do that, it's actually being vulnerable first, because you have to be vulnerable to actually hear somebody, what they're trying to say. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Now for our third question, I was wondering, do you, are you interested in trying out our curveball question? Of course, yeah, okay. I love curveballs. <laughs> okay, so this is um, our new question. Knowing what you know now, were you prepared to become a CEO when you did? What would you, or what do you wish that you knew starting out? The number one thing is nobody has all the answers. And it, you know, those that pretend they do, they don't. And it's very, very intimidating. So. I, I wish I had known that because you go into a situation, it's like, okay, well, I don't know anywhere near as much, but everyone had to actually ask and fail in order to succeed and to know, to know it was okay to fail. Essentially that, that was huge. I wish somebody had, had told me that because you don't go in a situation thinking it's ever okay to mess up, but everybody, everybody does it. I mean, you have to, you have to quite frankly, fall flat in your face in order to figure out what works for you, what works for the company, what works for the process in order to be good at it. So I wish somebody had shared that with me. Does that answer the question? Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, so you can hit the curveball. Yeah, the, <laughs> knocked it out of the park. Um, so, <laughs> 1927 gonna... Yankees right here. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, I'm going to now introduce our second student presenter who will introduce our next executive. And that is Adelina Carrera. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Adilene Carrera and I will be, it is such a pleasure to introduce you all to Dean Storker. He is the founder, executive chairman and former CEO of Alteryx, which is a company that offers end-to-end -end software platform for data analytics, for data science and analytics. Uh, fun fact, this software is actually being taught here at Cal State Fullerton in a couple of finance, accounting and data science classes. 
Um, Alteryx does business with 7,000 other companies around the world throughout 93 different countries and currently has 1,600 employees. Dean decided to start his company after growing up in a family business and seeing the possibility there was to create something and help others build careers. Uh, with this, please give him a warm welcome. Uh, thank you. Before you jump into the questions, uh, let me also uh, echo what Jessica uh, said about uh, this being a great honor. You know, I, I in the second half of my life, I, I hope to spend it with young entrepreneurs who want to build incredible things and uh, maybe a little afraid to get there. So I think what uh, Jay has put together in, in the uh, Center for Leadership uh, is is fantastic. I've been to a number of events, <clears throat> had the pleasure of being on his TV show, been at your conferences, and um, it's amazing what, what happens when you liberate the thinking of young people who want to change the world. So congrats to, to all of you, whatever you decided to do in your career. Thank you. Thank you so much for those words. Um, we're going to start with those same three introductory questions. The first one being, at the start of your career, did you ever envision yourself running a company? Uh, I didn't really envision myself running a company. I did, <clears throat> I did always envision myself building something. Um, I didn't know what that was. Uh, you know, I think that we all, especially at a young age where <clears throat> you, you really don't know what the world's going to toss at you. Um, I, I've always prided myself on uh, working with my hands and building things. I used to build homes with my, my father many, many years ago. And I always knew that I wanted to build something. And I wasn't sure if it was a great career, uh, a great marriage, a great relationship, a great friendship, or a great company. Uh, it turns out it ended up being a, a great company. But I don't think you start by saying, I'm going to be a, a, you know, a company leader. I think you say you're going to build something to change the world, and the rest kind of takes care of itself. Awesome. Thank you. Our next question is, what characteristics have you developed to become the leader you are today? Well, I, I think like Jessica, I, I think uh, it's evolving. You know, I, I think that um, anyone who leads a company and thinks that things are stagnant and don't change, they're <laughs> sorely mistaken. Uh, the, the leadership style and skills that you have to have uh, when you're early stage with 20 employees and doing $5 million is way different than the leadership skills required at 1,600 em employees as a public company um, where you've got investors in an $8 billion organization. And so it, it's, I, I think that the message is that, that the skills and traits you have to have are the ones that you have to have at the time you need them. And sometimes that's leading from the front. Sometimes that's leading from the back. I think it's, um, you know, I, I think in general, people think that leadership is about how many followers you have, and it's not. It's actually about how many leaders you create. And so you got to help leaders um, find those traits and those skills to, to be good at whatever stage of leadership they're going into. So for me, especially with COVID, I think one of the skills that I've learned is Empathetic selling, because um, so many people are going such going through such difficult times that you can't when you can't go face to face and you know they're hurting and they're suffering and you know many people got laid off. You have to kind of rethink uh, your posture and and use different skills. And so to me, that's that's been fun. The journey isn't a straight line that requires the same skill sets. There are different skills all the time, and I think it's important that. In order to learn the right skills, you got to make sure that, um, I think Jessica said this too, is that I think God gave you two ears and one mouth, and I think you should use them proportionally. Yeah, my father came up with that one. <laughs> yeah, and I like to remind him when I need to, but it doesn't land the same. <laughs> no, but, it, but, it, but, it's, but it's true. I think that when, you, when, when you're the smartest guy in the room where you think you are, you, you end up never having the skills um, to, to lead organizations. So do, do more listening than talking. Wonderful. Thank you. Our final question is knowing what you know now, 
Were you prepared to become a CEO when you did? What do you wish you knew starting out? Oh, there's so there's that's a trick question. Yeah, <clears throat> that's it. We're trying um, to trick you. That's what we're doing. <laughs> well, well. Uh, so the, many many people, especially after taking the company public, have asked me, you know, Dean, you're now 63. What would what would you tell your 25 year old uh, younger self? <laughs> and I would tell myself, don't wait until your 40s to start a business. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, um, uh, I, I think that, that I definitely would have started earlier. I think that you have to kind of do your self-assessment of, as, as to your risk reward profile, uh, whatever that reward is. Hopefully it's not just a monetary reward. Hopefully it's, you know, some, some, some other kind of emotional re reward than, than just monetary. But uh, you got to figure out what it is you seek, <clears throat> and you got to start early enough to make sure that you can complete the journey. And for me, I, I um, was unsure of what I didn't know, and I finally got to the the point of just saying, "I'm never going to know it all." And and any any CEO or business leader who thinks they they know it all just they, they won't be successful. And so I think the key is make sure you. You, um, you're, you make yourself vulnerable. Make sure that you um, are willing to listen to criticism about who you are or what you don't know so that you can surround yourself with people who have those skills because you can't, you can't possess all the things necessary. Hmm. Awesome, thank you. So now we have um, more specific questions for our executives and we're gonna use the Leadership Scholars Board uh, to ask these questions. Our first question will be asked by Dayton Lee. Um, so my question is for So Dayton, Jessica. before you ask your question, go ahead and introduce yourself and, and, and what role you play at the center. Uh, so hi, I'm Dayton. I'm a second year at Cal State Fullerton. And I currently sit on the Community Outreach Board. Um, and so moving on to my question, my question is for Jessica. Um, my question is, what sacrifices did you have to make to get to where you are now? That's a great question. Thank you very much, Dayton. Uh, and so the biggest sacrifice that, that I made to get to where I am now um, was, was my health, quite frankly. Um, and so obviously I'm healthy now, but along the way I, I sacrificed a lot. I, I had some health issues because I just literally, I did not pay attention to self-love, self-care. And, you know, you, it's important. Somebody once told me, it's like, why don't you treat yourself like the person that you love the most, how you treat. And so I would just not uh, take enough time for lunch. I would not have a mental break and I, I worked myself to the bone. And, you know, I had two, I had two babies back to back, 15 months apart. And my first one came, I was seven and a half months pregnant when I became president uh, of my organization when Obamacare was hitting, you know, a girl's dream. Woo. And as the only female, right, <laughs> Dean, you hear me, as the only female executive. And so it was for me, it was like, okay, why well, can't like ask for a maternity leave or certainly, you know, it would be nice. Anyway, I could have taken it, but like I... I decided to not do that. And as a result, like it was not okay. My health suffered greatly to where, you know, I eventually did take my time. It's all right. But like, I, I just, I realized I sacrificed a lot of that. I sacrificed my health and my well being to get to where I am today because obviously, like during that time, uh, which is amazing, I still I was able to do a great job, but at the expense of, of a lot of other things. And so that did help me to where I'm getting today because, um, if I, you know, if I didn't show up to work that day and not when I, I'm not talking about the part where I was pregnant, but you know, like if, if I didn't make that particular meeting with the executive committee, you know, because I was feeling sick that day, you know? And so that did help me to where I got today essentially, but I don't know if it was, it was the best thing. And so I guess it's a two part question. Uh, that was a sacrifice, but it, it helped me get to where I am today, but I don't agree with it. Not if it impacts your health, I should say. And I, I did sacrifice a lot of uh, a lot of friendships, and at the time, I did not know it was a sacrifice. I mean, it felt like a sacrifice, but in the end, like it's amazing because when you don't have enough time to to give everybody, right? And when you're used to just always being there for somebody and doing so much for somebody, but when you realize, like, look, I don't have enough time for myself anymore, 
And I literally just start pulling back from friendships and, you know, especially being out of college, that's when, you know, your friendships through high school, through college, that's the most important part, right? That brings us to where, you know, it helps us figure out who we're going to be in life and your friends are your friends, you know? And so as you get a little older, we kind of decide what works best for everybody. But I literally just didn't have enough time to call people back in a certain frame, um, time frame, And so it was like a sacrifice. But in the end, it was it was it was good. Some of them I, I'm sad I didn't keep in contact, but some of them I, it was a blessing because it wasn't always that healthy to begin with, right? And so I, I believe that is a lot of what I had to sacrifice. I didn't have a lot of time to do the fun things I wanted to do. Urban leadership. Thank you. It's 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 like that's a difficult question to answer, you know, because it's like what did you sacrifice, but at the same time, like was it worth it or do you regret it? But it all eventually, like I can't say that helped me get here. I mean, this is where I am today, mm -hmm. and uh, how I've envisioned a sacrifice is like okay, something maybe I I regret and, and but everything that led me to here I am today, I, I'm completely content with. And I'm happy with mm -hmm. it. So it's Thanks. it's a difficult question to answer. Okay, well, thank you so much for answering it the way that you did. Um, our next question will be given by Daisy Lee. Hi, my name is Daisy Lee, and I am the VP of the Human Resource Board, and my major is Human Resource, and this is my last year at Cal State Fullerton. And my question is, what were the biggest challenges you faced when you were just starting your company? This is uh, for me? Yes. Well, Daisy, um, everything was a challenge. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting that you're coming from an HR perspective, because I think at the end of the day, a software company is all about people. And so I think the biggest challenge, not just at the beginning, of the, the business, but I think even to today is how do you how do you get real quality engagement from workers? Um, how do you how do you make it an inclusive uh, environment where people can show up as their authentic selves? It's a little bit different in the early stages. I mean, there's the challenges were you know I went 14 years self funded. Um, and doing that in the software world where slow growth is slow death is, is pretty challenging. So I, I would say that that, that was uh, difficult. Um, I think that um, early on, uh, most entrepreneurs, I'm sure people who, who are on the phone listening to the call, you have great ideas about some product you want to build or some business you want to get into. And and I, I think one of the challenges I had is that nobody believed in my idea. Um, and it was frustrating because it was the best idea ever. <laughs> and, and I think that the message to people who start businesses is no one is going to like your idea as much as you. And just be prepared for uh, some hard knocks because of that. I mean, I, because I didn't have any money, I had to, to you know, mortgage my house. I had two young kids at home. Um, you know, and like Jessica, you work your, your tail off and you don't take care of yourself. You know, I, in fact, I, I believe so much in marriage. I did it twice. Cause I, I spent too much time, uh, working in the first uh, half of the, the 23 years that I've built the business. Um, uh, but you know, even raising money, my in-laws didn't even like my idea. They, they loaned me money at 18% usury rates. And, and I said, why is, why is it so expensive? And they said, we just don't think this is a great idea. And, I, and I'm like, wait a minute. So I, I think everything is a challenge in the early going. I think that um, good leaders recognize what you can accomplish and what you can't accomplish and then surround yourself with the resources, the, the people, the money, the time to cover off on the things that you don't know. And um, I learned a ton of stuff for the first time. You know, I, that old saying that uh, never stop learning, that's in, in the leadership position, you are always learning. You're learning about how to, how to pivot, how to change, how to, you know, lead this team one way and this team another way because they're different uh, organizational cultures um, and have to figure out a way to, to create an inclusive environment. You've got to have a, you know, a philosophy for uh, about doing good with software. 
there's a million challenges. Um, I don't know which, you're all gonna have your own challenge. And the key is make, make sure that you recognize your blind spot. Um, and if you don't know your blind spot, ask your um, significant other or ask your parent or ask your roommate or ask your colleague or ask Jay. Jay's, Jay's not quiet. He'll tell you what your blind spot is. Right, Jay? <laughs> well, or, or Rosie might know. Might, Rosie might know even better than I might. But absolutely, people who are close to you, people who are in your life, um, they, especially those in your life that want to see you succeed and want to see you uh, thrive, ask them. Ask them for that type of feedback. Um, it's not always feedback people will offer unless you ask for it. And it's sometimes painful to hear, but uh, go in with an open mind. It's a gift. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you so much. So actually, before we continue with the questions, I was wondering if both Dean and Jessica could just speak a little quickly about what their company does and what, um, you know, just to talk a little bit about your company so that everybody can put all these questions into context. Go ahead, Jessica. And Jessica, I think you're on mute. Haven't we heard that like a thousand times in the last three weeks? <laughs> okay, hold on. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, very interesting. I have to switch back and forth between audio things. I only have one. Okay, so um, I will go first. And so uh, thank you for that question. So my name is Jessica. We're president of the Ward and Brown General Agency. And <clears throat> we are located, you know, I offices up and down the state in California and Nevada. And what my business does, I, I, we work in the health benefit side, medical, dental, vision, and life and health insurance. And so our end user is not the consumer, it, it's, a, it, it's a B2B essentially. And so I, my end user is a broker. And so we help the broker, uh, we have our own proprietary, proprietary quoting software tool. We have uh, our own IT department, a lot of homegrown software. And so we help the broker quote the entire marketplace and then we actually help them sell it when they're going out to our core competency would be small group and large group uh, with a sprinkle of IFP every now and then, but not a big focus, IFP being individual family plans. Uh, and so we, we help small groups and large groups get health insurance for their employees. And so we have our own quoting system that quotes the entire marketplace for California and in Nevada, separate regulation, separate rates, of course. And then we help the, uh, the broker actually sell the group. We'll go out there on behalf of the broker or with the broker. And then and when, we're, when we have an actual sale, we help enroll it. And therefore we bring the case back and we underwrite it. And then we have, uh, I have contracts, my carrier, my partners are carrier partners. Um, and so which all the major medical and dental and ancillary. Ancillary is what we call uh, everything except medical. So dental, vision and life, you know, so. And our sister company is California Choice. Some of you may be familiar with this. This is something that we had created in 1995, the first private exchange model um, in California and, and, and nationwide, actually. So uh, really proud of that. And so we, we just do the front end with the selling and then the back end for the broker account management. And so that is what we do. We help brokers get their clients coverage because at the end of the day, my favorite part is I'm helping getting uh, coverage for those families and individuals that need it, health insurance. And so that is what I do. I've been in my role uh, since, I've been president since 2013. I ran operations for several years prior to that. And I started working for the company off and on since I was eight years old, but that goes against labor, labor laws. It's a family business. So. Didn't, hear, didn't hear any of that. Yeah, yeah. Nothing? No, just, just the child labor stuff. <laughs> Isn't it broken again? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, that's a, that's just a joke. I, you know, my, it's, I work, work for a family business. My father being John Word and my his business partner, Rusty Brown. I started it when I was eight years old, but I graduated college in Cal State Fullerton in 2000. So I'm 43 dating myself now. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, so I'm Dean Stoker. Um, yeah, founder and, and CEO of Altrix for uh, 23 years. Uh, I just two months ago became executive chairman, turning the reins over to uh, a gentleman named Mark Anderson, who's one of, I think, just two, two people in Silicon Valley who've 
scaled uh, software organizations to a billion dollars in revenue. He's done it actually twice. Uh, we go to market with a uh, data science and analytics platform. Uh, it is an end-to-end -end process so that you can ingest any kind of data, big, little, structured, unstructured. You can clean it, organize it, standardize it, run any analytic process from simple diagnostic uh, uh, dashboards that might end up in a, a Tableau or a Power BI, uh, all the way up through complex machine learning algorithms that can solve some of the world's uh, most challenging problems. Uh, we sell it to analysts so they can get their lives out of Excel hell, uh, doing complex VLOOKUPs. We sell it to almost every industry and almost every use case. Um, the world's largest employer, uh, Walmart, uses us for almost everything, including 200 seats, Daisy, and HR, where they do HR analytics. Uh, we sell it to Goldman Sachs to do derivatives modeling. We sell it to Southwest Airlines to do hedging of fuel. We sell it to insurance companies to mitigate risk, uh, telcos to eliminate churn. And that's what makes it fun. It's, it's a, an all general purpose end-to-end -end platform that's code free for the the analyst uh, code code free for the analyst code friendly for the trained statistician and um, uh, we went 14 years self-funded we I, as much as I didn't like raising I, I you know I never believed in losing my money why would I ever believe in losing somebody else's so I was very careful not to raise any money until um, I knew I could uh, figure out the go to market but for all of just just as an aside, for all of you who are thinking about starting your company and becoming the CEO, you only have one job as CEO, one job, and that's to make sure you can keep the company alive long enough until someone helps you find the product market fit. It, it took us 14 years for that to occur, 14 years. So be patient. Um, uh, 14 years in, we started raising money, raised 163 million in three rounds over four years, had massive growth. Uh, one of the greatest software success stories in Orange County history. Um, took the company public March 24th of 17. Uh, sit at a, a, an $8 million market cap today with, with just so much upside uh, at the moment. So anyway, uh, that's a little little brief on, on the company. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so our next question will be from Maribel Diaz. If you could introduce yourself and ask Jessica your question. So thank you so much for coming, Jessica. So my name is Maribel Diaz. I am a super senior graphic designer slash illustrator, and I'm part of the marketing board. So this is my question. How have you leveraged your community to get to where you are right now? And so your, your focus was, yeah, with, you had a lot of those things. So you said marketing. Is there a marketing in there, flair in there? Yes. Okay, wonderful. That was my focus, business marketing. Uh, and so it's a blessing to be here. So... This is, uh, for me, a two-part question, you know, so, and I'll answer it, I'll answer the first, uh, my initial thought, and then I had the, the more, okay, well, I do work with my community, but when, when I initially saw this question, how I leverage my community, and so I kind of had to think, and I thought, you know, with my community, like, I, my community is not industry-specific, this is a two-part, it is, and this is the first part where it's not. It's both, right? And so my community is not what one would consider an industry specific, a blog dedicated to it or whatnot. It's actually kind of just another word for what I call my tribe, you know, and that includes people that I hold near and dear to my heart. Uh, people, you know, obviously in my family and in my extended family, which is my, my work family. And it, it, it also includes, you know, personal and professional mentors that have helped me get to where I am today. And it also includes the ones um, that people, which I learned how not to behave, right? And so all of this, all in all, it has, it has helped. I've leveraged what I've learned with the good and with bad, how I don't want to do or behave because that's a situation that I, I was in where I didn't feel good about it. So I don't want to, you know, have anyone else go through that situation if I can prevent it, right? And so I'm grateful for that. And it's just, you know, I tend to surround myself with people I try to. Uh, people that inspire me and then even those that um even those that I resisted to want to get to know because it turns out a lot of those people were somebody that you know, I actually learned a lot from and some of them good and some of them okay I was correct and whatnot um but it just I learned more I should say it's all life experience and then my professional community um it, it's 
I, I've leveraged them in, in a way that they, they've taught me so much. And so I, I'm a part of the National Association of um, Health Underwriters, and that is a national level. We just were, you know, Capitol Hill February earlier this year and helping, you know, what's going on with our, our healthcare um, <clears throat> mandates and whatnot. And they have regional state levels as well. Um, and so I'm a part of I'm a part of those boards, and I'm a part of just trying to find ways to be more efficient in the technology world, and whatnot. And because it, I've I've now a part of this really brand new uh, amazing committee, I'm excited about. It's the first technical uh, committee on the on the national level, which is going to help align our entire healthcare system in all different states because everyone's using different antiquated systems in different states. Everyone's at different levels, and so it all comes together. But uh, I, I've learned a lot, and so I, I've tried to, I've tried to take the information that people you know because it's a, a relationship industry world that everybody lives in every day. It doesn't matter the industry; it's just relationships really, really, really matter. In fact, my dad taught me years ago: always be kind to the receptionists at a, at a business because one day they will and, and can become CEO. Not they will, but they can be. So always be kind. Um, that's just. The sidebar, uh, but I've also been involved with the Woman in Business event that, that actually came from a CAHU event, which is California Association of Health Underwriters. But I've been a part of creating a really uh, neat event. This will be our second year. It was supposed to be earlier this year, but COVID uh, would not allow for that. But we're going to be doing it in um, April of next year in Vegas. And essentially, my involvement with all of these organizations has helped me uh, stay informed, helped me network, and helped me continue to position Warren Brown as, uh, as a necessary partner in the insurance space. And I'm also on the Cal Chamber board. So while it's not 100% focused in industry insurance vertical, per se, it allows me to keep my pulse on the regulatory, legislative, and speak up on health insurance-related topics uh, when asked, right, in hopes it to positively impact our business. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next question will be uh, presented by Tiffany Corden. Hi, everyone. My name is Tiffany Corden. I'm a second year. Um, I'm a human resources concentration, and I'm also on the HR board for the Center for Leadership Scholars. So my question is for you, Dean. Um, how did you adapt and begin to work through your responsibilities as a CEO? Well, um, I mean, you always have to adapt. I don't think it, there's not a moment in time where you say, now's the time I have to pivot. You're pivoting almost every day to, to something that you, you don't know. And, and I think for, for me, I, I tried to surround myself with mentors that gave me good ideas on things I could do to foster learning. So I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, I'm, I'm a Sun Tzu Art of War fan. Uh, if you think back to the 13th century, um, well, 13 BC, so we're going way back. And he, he had all kinds of great things around. Um, some ideas, they actually, he, they've rolled out books uh, around Sun Tzu's Art of War for Business, Art of War for Leadership. And, and they, they take these old, old ideas and they, they, they craft them to be a bit more modern. So how do you, in our case, because we didn't raise any money, how do you um, go into, how do you win a war without going into a battle so that you can help, you know, conserve resources? How do you look strong um, to your enemies when you're actually weak? Or how do you look uh, frail when you're actually strong to sort of outsmart your competitors. So I, I, I relied on Sun Tzu quite a bit. The, the most important thing I, I got from Sun Tzu was, was uh, he had a, um, a great phrase. It was strategy without tactics is the slowest route to victory. Tactics without uh, strategy is the noise before defeat. And so I put together in 2004, uh, a strategic planning team called Bing Fa, and we get together every month, face-to-face uh, -face twice a year, and we, we align on business strategy, and then we define tactical execution, and then we hold each other accountable. And for me, that was really a, a kind of a seminal moment um, in, in knowing what to do to, to run the business. I, didn't, I, I couldn't have done it myself. I had to have my team, and so part of the leadership role is how do you get a diverse set of people together 
our, our strength is in our differences, not in our similarities. And so how do you get a, a diverse group of people together uh, to formulate well-founded strategies and how do you identify all of the mission critical functional work streams and their executions and timelines, KPIs uh, to, see, uh, to see success. The, the other one came from actually a, a, another mentor who was one of my, it wasn't really my mentor to begin with, but he became my mentor. I never met him. I obviously never met Sun Tzu. <laughs> uh, but my, my father was a huge um, Buckminster Fuller fan. And I don't know if people know Buckminster Fuller, but probably the one of the biggest inventors of all time, but never really made it much success. He didn't, he didn't monetize it because he, he wanted to change the world. He didn't really care about uh, making a killing on it. But think about the first autonomous vehicle it was really Buckminster Fuller back in the 50s. Uh, think about the geodesic dome. So he, he was a very, very creative guy, kind of a systems theorist, um, architect, designer, mathematician, scientist. It, 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 he was a, a Walter Mitty. And uh, I went to University of Colorado, 1976, our nation's bicentennial. And my father was a huge Buckminster Fuller fan. And uh, this was the year they had the um, Conference on World Affairs in, in Boulder. They have it every year. But this was the bicentennial. And to pay tribute to my father, I said, OK, I'll go see Buckminster Fuller. And Buckminster Fuller said the most profound thing to me that I've ever heard. And to this day, it helps me lead the company and guide the company. Um, even, in, even in, in retirement, it, it's helped me figure out what I'm supposed to do in the second half uh, of my life. He, he said, in the middle of this conference room, it was, it was 100 students there. Um, it, was, it was titled, Everything I Know by Buckminster Fuller. And it, was, it lasted about seven hours. But about halfway through, he stopped and he said, we are, <clears throat> he said, we're building all the right technologies for all of the wrong reasons. And, and we are never gonna be able to take care of spaceship Earth very well in there for very long if we don't see it as a common cause. It has to be all of us or none of us. And that helped me formulate HR programs to, to get our employees engaged around um, philanthropy, giving back, doing good with data and analytics. Um, we started that program kind of unofficially in 2008 uh, much more officially in, in 2016, uh, last year, we gave away $300 million of software. All of our employees have the opportunity to give their time to 501 C3s. Um, we don't care if they give software. We don't care if they go give hugs and, you know, food baskets, uh, warm handshakes, but it, it allows us to build a culture, which I think is, I, I mean, I screwed up a ton in 23 years, lots of strange decisions because I, I didn't know. And so you try stuff. But the one thing that holds companies together is when you build a, a culture that's inclusive, that's giving. Um, a lot of people join us today. They say they join us because um, we actually have the right culture, not the right product, not the right salary, not the right benefits, although we have those two. It's the right culture. And to me, that's, I pride myself on that. Awesome. Our next question is going to be given by Daisy Lee to Jessica. Hi, my name is Daisy Lee. And uh, yeah, again, and I'm on the Human Resource Board for BPO Human Resource Board, a major in Human Resource. And this is my last year. And my question for, t for Jessica is, what characteristic do you look for as a trait in all your employees? All right, well, hi, Daisy. Thank you for the question. It's a great question. And blessings on your journey and everyone's journey. So, uh, you know, being an HR, that, 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 that's, a, that's a fun and exciting um, industry, uh, not industry, but role to be in. It's, it's always a challenging one, right? Um, and so, and it comes down to the employee. Um, bring them in and managing it. And then of course, having to manage the ones that need to be managed out. So um, what I look for as a trait in all my employees are, are traits that it, it's going to, for me, uh, know if I, if they have these XYZ traits we're about to share, then I know they're going to be at my company for, 
you know, hopefully a lifetime, you know, but, but they're committed and that feels good, you know, which, which can help every HR situation, right? Um, and so integrity is number one, that is paramount above all. And I don't just apply these traits uh, just specific for work. You know, for myself personally, like I can't just operate how I do at the office and then completely change and be different at home. And so integrity is important all around in my life. People that I, people that I want in my life, people that I care about and want them close to, you know, in my life to keep them there. But integrity is most important because I care honestly about my family. Like my word brown family is my family. And so integrity is very, very important to me. Uh, without, without it, you're just, you know, you're not serving, you're not your authentic version of yourself, what you should be. You're not serving anybody but yourself. And that doesn't work at all in longevity. I should say passion. It would be the number two. Uh, if you don't have passion, you're just not alive and you're, you're just not thriving. It's really important because you know what you're going to do, well, you're going to start, you're going to try many different things, you know, especially coming out of college and, you don't know what you want to do, but the list of what you don't want to do gets bigger, right? And so what, of what you're willing to put up with gets smaller. And but having the passion and to know, like, you know, if somebody is somebody actually committed to this and how committed are they? Because all of us have interactions with people on a daily basis, uh, you know, whether it's a teller, a checkout person at the grocery store, it's a customer service phone, you can tell when somebody is really just is not happy with their job. And that comes through the phone, it comes through interactions. And it, that to me is really important because how you are behaving in any situation, that's affecting everybody around you. And that's how you show up, you know, and which leads me to the next one, which would be self-awareness. Be aware of how you show up. Be aware that if you're coming in with a bad attitude, well, generally, like you're just going to be attracting bad energy. And so, not, not everybody can be happy every day. And those that are, no, even they, they don't make a pill for that. <laughs> I don't believe it. Um, it won't last at least, right? And so, having self awareness of how you show up is so is so important, and and how you impact people is, is so important. So that self awareness and. Um, in reacting and self-awareness that that's just not when you're in person self-awareness to know like if you have something you need to say to somebody that's maybe not going to land good it's something that's been eating up inside do not text it do not email it if you want to write it out go for it do 20 times you're about to but just sit on it don't ever send it wait till the next morning because you'll be like oh what was I thinking trust me anything that's really important needs to be shared with somebody face to face because it's never going to land the way you think it needs to land through, through anything being typed out. So self-awareness is huge. And of course, I'll round this up with the fourth most important thing. It's called self-confidence and the courage to, to, you know, knowing the truth of who you are. And it's not based on achievements, but having the courage to believe in yourself. Remember, there is no wrong question and just believing in yourself and having the courage. And like I said, it's not based, self-confidence is not based on achievements, but it's just believing who you are and, and holding true to your true, um, authentic self. So there you go. Thank you. Thank you. So now actually we are going, because we're kind of running out on time a little bit. So we're going to break up into the breakout rooms. So the um, leadership scholars who have questions, please ask those questions in the breakout rooms. And also we're opening up for everyone to ask questions. So this is really a good opportunity to um, have some more um, personal time with the executives. So Razi, it all like um, that concludes this Meet the Executives event. So we all want to thank Jessica Word and Dean Stoker so much for being a part of this event. We really can't tell you how much we appreciate it and how much that we've learned and enjoyed hearing from you. Also, we want to say to all the students, thank you for coming and participating this year. We look forward to seeing you next year and good luck on finals and just stay healthy, stay safe, and have a happy holidays. Luck, so, is, is any... luck, luck is for the unprepared. Oh, okay, so <laughs> the prepare, that's what I should say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, anything you wanna say, Dr. J, you're on mute. Thank you, yes, luck is when preparation meets opportunity, right, Dean? Right. <laughs> um, any final words, Jessica, Dean? To oh, serendipitous is that as well, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <bit. laughs>
No, but thank you. Happy holidays and many blessings to you and your families during this time and stay safe. And, you know, I'm just, I'm blessed to be part of such a thing. So thank you. And Dean, I thought you had amazing answers. I can't wait to get to know you better. Good, Congratulations good. on your success. That's amazing. Thank you. You too. And, and everyone, uh, don't worry about New Year's Eve this year. We're going to have two of them next year. Yeah, that was, that was, that was, that was my next question. So I'm glad you covered it. We are. <laughs> No. Yeah, <laughs> I, I am. <laughs> I'm going to have Christmas in July. That's I'm going to have Thanksgiving in August. <laughs> That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Thank you, everyone, for being right, a part. Thank you. Happy, happy holidays. Be safe. Blessings. Right. Thank Bye -bye. you, Jay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Roz. It was fun. Thanks, everybody. You guys did a great job.